Welcome back to another edition of It's Your Health. Uh, I'm here with uh, my brother, Dr. Dan Benio. We're here Hello. to talk about a lot of exciting information. Stay tuned in just a minute, uh, and we'll be right back uh, uh, with another edition of It's Your Health. All right, we're ready to start the first segment of uh, It's Your Health, the uh, fastest half hour in television. I promise this will be even faster than uh, than my uh, father's show. Um, remember, on It's Your Health, that we talk about a lot of things that are extremely important, but anything you read about or hear about on our show, it's important that you review with your own healthcare provider before you implement anything we do on this show. Let's get lit off with some headlines, okay? I think there's some exciting headlines today. Sure. Hydrogel pill approved as a medical device for overweight and obesity. Very interesting. Uh, read up on this uh, earlier this week, and it's actually a device that it's a pill that you swallow, and it breaks out into a thousand different little particles, and that then absorbs water and makes you fuller. Uh, it's not a stimulant, and it's um, basically all uh, organic material. Um, to allow for weight loss. Yeah, I, I found this very interesting. It's a pill called Plenty. I think they come up with unique names for this. Mm. Uh, it's little part, bits of cellulose combined with citric acid and salt. Um, very safe, and it just is going to swell up and give you a fuller feeling. Um, I, I think it's you know certainly a novel agent compared sure. to what we've had already um, uh, in the past, and it, it sounds like it has to be safe, but you know, we'll see when that comes out. More on It's Your Health. Next, nearly 20% of migraine patients use opioids as treatment. Yeah, this is uh, kind of a challenge with treating migraines, and sometimes we see these legacy patients, uh, some of the ones who've had migraines for years, maybe decades, who have been prescribed opioids, chronic pain medication to treat them, and while it does relieve the headache, that's not really for their intended use, and kind of leads to uh, rebound headaches uh, in the future. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah. I've, I grew up in a phase of medicine that opioids were a lot more popular and more accepted. And in just today's day and world, they're really there's not there's there's a much more limited role. <laughs> and certainly, chronic migraines is one of them. And and there is a lot of data to show that there is some rebound effects to these medications. Certainly. Last headline: The FDA approves a novel agent for osteoporosis in a new class. Eventi, I believe, is how we pronounce it, as an injection line. Yeah. Razulumab is the uh, monoclonal antibody, and um, it's to help supplement that osteoporosis, which in individuals can be a game changer if you develop a fracture. Osteoporosis, certainly the thinning of the bones. Uh, there's multiple treatments for it, bisphosphonates, prolia, other injectables hormone replacement as well. They all come with their own side effects and adverse events. Um, it looks as though this is promising. I believe it's a monthly injection which kind of detracts from the every six months to once a year injections of the other classes. Right, and you know, we have some people that do very well on Prolia, but every now and then we have some side effects and this just presents us a new option. Um, osteoporosis is something you, you don't want to wait until you have it. Uh, you certainly want to be more about prevention. Um, it's cold and flu season. It's let's coming. talk about um, let's talk about some different treatments. How do we identify what the common cold is versus do I need an antibiotic for that? Um, you know, I'm getting a lot of calls for Z packs because of allergies. You know, mm. I, 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 they're not indicated for that. I don't think, I don't but, think so. Um, but let's talk about kind of the differences between the common cold versus uh, a true infection. Sure. Usually, common cold is. Um, almost a viral infection, not influenza, but it certainly is not bacterial either, and generally can present with a runny nose, a dry cough, generally not having a fever, sometimes a low-grade fever. Weakness, fatigue, muscle aches can be associated with it. We sometimes see the duration lasting almost on average about eight days, um, and it's thought Per guidelines, we try to initiate antibiotics um, after 10 days when people are showing these symptoms, and it shows that antibiotics really don't um, improve outcomes with the common cold um, and rather cause more harm. 
Yeah, I agree. One of the you know one of the number one side effects of an antibiotic is a cough, and people are often causing. I keep having this cough. I keep having this cough, and often, especially some of the cephalosporins, you'll see cough as a side effect of that, and they'll develop that actually while on the antibiotic. It certainly they are overprescribed. We've tried to do our best to steward that a little bit, and and you're going to see more of a push. And we'll talk about later some things we can do for for sicker patients to decide you know when you need an antibiotic, when not. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about preventing infection, uh, you know it's cold flu, it's pneumonia season, we're going to see that. There's been some recommendations uh, about you know, people coming in saying, I need my other pneumonia shot or I need mm. the second one. Um, there's two pneumonia shots, uh, Pneumovax 23, that's the older one, and now Prevnar 13. Why don't mm -hmm. you talk a moment about what the recommendations are and who should get what? Sure, so pneumonia is a um, huge risk to mortality, uh, especially in our older individuals. Um, we typically, the pneumonia vax, P23, can be given uh, before the age of 65 in chronic conditions. Um, high blood pressure, smokers, lung disease, heart disease, kidney disease. And it's thought we give it every five years until they reach the age of 65. And then there's a newer uh, pneumonia shot called Prevnar that we generally give at 65. That's a one and done. Once you get it, you get it in the next life, I guess. But the Prevnar or the pneumonia vax then after the age of 65, you don't have to receive it again. So the Prevnar, which is the newer one, allows for greater response and protection from pneumonia. Cool. I think it's, um, I, I, I want to skip to a little last part of our segment here because we're starting to run out of time. Um, let's talk a moment about procalcitonin levels. Mm. And that's something that's a new test. In fact, I, I had not heard of this test up until really this year and I saw it being started to be used in our emergency room and actually by some of the younger docs coming out of school as a, as a way to really decide how sick is someone and whether or not they really need an antibiotic. And you know, before we used our clinical judgment to base antibiotic use, but now we actually have some laboratory testing that can help us decide. Yeah, it, it is almost a marker that we use similar to other chronic conditions um, and it tells us whether or not it's a bacterial versus viral infection or another process. It doesn't necessarily mean it's 100%. Certainly when someone comes in sick acutely and they have various vital sign derangement, we start antibiotics to err on the side of caution and we get this blood test that helps us tailor our future treatment and it shows that when this is not elevated then it's safe to kind of back down on the antibiotics and it kind of improves mortality. Absolutely, because when we start bombing away with the IV antibiotics in the hospital, if you don't need them, we can cause harm with that. Mm -hmm. So it's important sometimes to not get antibiotics. That sometimes is the harder decision. Well, that's the first segment of It's Your Health. Wow. Um, we rolled through it. There's some really important messages we're going to talk about, and those are called commercials. And so I want you to pay attention to all those, uh, and we'll be right back with you on the next segment of It's Your Health. Welcome back to the second segment of It's Your Health, your leader in healthcare information. Let's get back to some more riveting headlines. I have to admit, you pick some better headlines than I do. Mm. Men's birth control pill shows promise in month-long study. This may be coming, uh, maybe not. It uh, is a new uh, type of tailored treatment towards birth control, now focusing more on the male gender instead of surgical vasectomies. Uh, it's thought that maybe there's an oral contraceptive for men that kind of regulates or decreases the amount of testosterone. It certainly is interesting. Um, when people get worried about decreasing testosterone, you know, that can sometimes decrease sex drive. But this actually is tailored in such a way that it only decreases the part that's going to allow for spermatogenesis and actually work. Uh, a month-long study doesn't seem that long, um, but they've been talking about this stuff for a while. Um, I think this is certainly, for someone who doesn't want, that wants to family plan now and, and say, geez, I don't want a family now, but I want one later, and I really want to make sure I want to do my due diligence and not trust on someone else, this is a great way for guys to kind of take control of that. Um, uh, and then as opposed to going for a vasectomy, which I, I think is the best way for family planning if you're really not going to have a family anymore. That's a very safe, easy, and inexpensive procedure. Mm -hmm. But this is certainly a, a unique alternative, which we don't have a lot of right now. Oh, certainly. Next. Excess calcium supplements are linked to cancer death risk. Yeah, this headline somewhat uh, an eye grabber, shocking. Um, basically, what it's saying is eating 
too much of one thing is uh, can be a bad thing. So moderation, and they're showing that a thousand milligrams of calcium greater than that per day can actually cause adverse effects, and that maybe we're not really taking multivitamins, so multiple vitamins, magnesium, um, some of the other vitamins as well, and minerals that can actually provide assistance with calcium and vitamin D. Yeah, this actually goes back to something we talked a few years ago. That there was a big push that you, you, you to take all the calcium you want because well, your body will just get rid of what you don't mm -hmm. need. And then from a heart standpoint, it actually showed that increased heart attacks. You know, mm -hmm. because we had this excess calcium that was getting deposited on inflamed arteries, and that was causing a lot of hardening of the arteries and likely uh, heart attacks. And so then we backed off. And this is another reason, again, that you know excess calcium is shown to be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't need it, you shouldn't have to take a lot of extra of it. You know, and I. I don't see a lot of people doing that now, but uh, you yeah. still run into some people who like to do that. Um, moving on, intermittent fasting can boost me metabolic health, but has risks as well. Yeah, uh, I'm starting to actually see some of um, middle-aged and older patients asking about intermittent fasting. What is it exactly? It's when you go for a prolonged period of not eating. We intermittently fast naturally overnight because we're sleeping. It varies from uh, duration, 12 hours, 16, 18, 24, 36, two days. I've I even read fast of people doing a week straight. Um, some people report greater energy with it. Um, others report uh, improved appetite. For people with diabetes, it helps with their insulin uh, resistance, helps with weight loss. But this study was showing that maybe you lose a little lean muscle mass and maybe there's a risk of bone loss as well. Yeah, it certainly is something that you you know you should talk to a healthcare provider before you start undergoing that. And I think routinely fasting can sometimes get yourself in trouble. But it's you know some people have found that it'd be an effective way to kind of kickstart things. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on, the curse of sweet drinks that uh, really kind of looking at kids and what we need to do to help cut back on the calories. Childhood obesity is a alarming epidemic, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's really easy to say well they should just maybe cut back and go to some diet soda or some diet drinks. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we've talked about this uh, a couple of times regarding diet sodas, artificial sweeteners, um, and how they can actually increase the risk of weight gain. Um, and this is showing that kids who do diet sodas, while they may be thinking that they're improving uh, their caloric intake, they actually found that the kids will take the calories from somewhere else. They'll eat poorly on other foods or drink other drinks that uh, contain calories. So while you may save some calories with those diet drinks, um, children will eventually supplant it from somewhere else. Yeah, it goes back to clean eating. And I think we've seen that in adults as well. You know, they actually have shown some studies that you know adults who are drinking diet sodas actually gain weight and it's not because so much the diet soda is causing them to gain weight it's a fact that what it does to their percent mm -hmm. uh, perception of taste and how it regulates or dysregulates their insulin um, moving on I think there's a big controversy and it's, mm. it's growing controversy is e-cigarettes and vape use um, uh, I, I think it goes without saying that we shouldn't be using e-cigarettes with pregnancy but it's alarming how much that is actually that is happening that people feel that's safe yeah one in 14 pregnant women are vaping thinking that this is a safer alternative to cigarette use while at a first glance that may be true we really don't know the long-term effects of vaping it's not that these lung related diseases or conditions from vaping is you inhale a, um, a oil that is aerosolized and then as it enters your lung it forms into its liquid form and coats the lung and the lung forms a immune response and reaction to it causing some of these um, adverse effects that we're seeing from vaping. Right, right now, I mean, even just recently there's been the CDC's kind of come out and said, you know, we really need to be careful. There's been over 450 vape related, you know, injuries just in the last, you know, couple of weeks mm -hmm. and some vape related deaths. And, and the people who love the vape will tell you, well, that's only the people vaping THC, uh, uh, which is true to some extent, but there are also non THC related vape issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have an unrela unregulated industry using unregulated chemicals, you know, nothing that, that just can't go right. You know, I, I really think we need to pump the brakes here and, and be exercise some more caution, especially in pregnancy. I, I think that's just crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, moving on, let's talk a little bit about ADHD mm. and some of the, you know, ADHD, a very popular diagnosis. 
been more popular over the last few years. It's starting to wane a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Right. So yes. in, inattentiveness, um, difficulty focusing, restlessness, poor academic performance. Some will report sleep disturbance, anxiety, depression. Um, I don't typically prescribe many of the ADHD medications um, stimulant-based amphetamines. Um, generally, I usually have a psychiatrist uh, obtain the diagnosis, especially in an adolescent. Um, we're talking about a long-term condition that can have some effects uh, long-term as far as, as licensing and other issues with ADHD. I think that it's, you know, I, I, I really think it's, it's, it's our, our nation has done a disservice to our children. They've really kind of pushed this diagnosis, and some would argue that the pharmaceutical industry has pushed this diagnosis. And as a result, you know, we have a nation of kids who have been labeled with this, and there's consequences to that. Uh, well, something I do for fun is I'm a pilot. I fly, and I would never be able to get a license to fly an airplane, you know, or a medical clearance if I had a diagnosis of ADHD, even as a kid. You know, I would have to go through very expensive testing, tens of thousands of dollars of testing, to prove that that diagnosis was wrong. And if I had taken medications for it at some point, that's basically a no-fly. I will not be able to fly, and it's a career that is, uh, is a very popular career now, and it's going to be more popular. Um, uh, you know, there's consequences to this, and I, I think that, you know, some people argue that, you know, the way the government and the way the pharmaceutical industry has kind of conspired with this, it's, it's near a RICO Act type mm. uh, 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 controversy. Well, that's another, that's another discussion. stuff here we yeah. don't even have. We go over. <laughs> let's, let's wrap up the second segment and we'll uh, break for a moment so you can view these important messages and we'll be right back with the third segment of It's Your Health. Welcome back to the third and final segment of It's Fast. Your if you don't get it now, you're not going to get it. Okay. <laughs> um, you're leader in healthcare information. I'm supposed to say that. Okay. Well, let's move on. Uh, last set of headlines, you know, and then you're going to have to wait weeks for more. Invokana lowers kidney failure uh, in type 2 diabetes. Yeah, we're seeing this class more and more coming out with uh, better improvements of your health. Um, it's thought that this is renal protective SGL2 inhibitors um, and Invokana, one of them that is now showing some renal protection. Um, I have noticed with this class sometimes uh, when a patient is already on a diuretic, sometimes we have to monitor renal function closely, although sometimes I'll drop the diuretic and keep them on Invokana, which will provide what the diuretic was doing. Alrighty, well, let's stay in the class and we'll talk about Farsiga now is beneficial in type 2 diabetes patients with prior myocardial infarction. Yeah, um, Farsiga, that's uh, great for them, cardiovascular benefit. Um, it's actually thought that maybe cardiologists will start prescribing these traditionally diabetic meds uh, for heart protection almost as like it's a statin or aspirin in some individuals so they're really broadening out the protection that they're providing and it's becoming a class that we're going to start seeing more and more that are being prescribed not only to diabetics but then probably for cardiovascular protection. Yeah, I think it's, I'll be honest, and you can go back on the tape, I, I've been very skeptical of this class for a long time because of some of the ways it works and, and some of the concerns I had, but more and more it's just showing that I'm wrong. You know, the data is, is showing more and more that these are, these are effective medications. Safety-wise, they have to be chosen for the right patient, sure. but you know, it, it, you're not you know, I used to say that, well, the only thing it did was lower your sugar, and I have other medications that give me other things other than just lowering sugar. And that's not the case. It actually shows improved kidney function, you know, better stroke, or I should say better heart attack risk. And um, uh, one of my patients who's on uh, one of the other ones in that class, he was put on by his cardiologist, yeah. you know, who happens to be a diabetic, and his control was okay. But, you know, his cardiologist started him on that, and I was kind of caught me off guard. Um, so uh, certainly exciting things that come with this class, which is a relatively young class. It has not been out long. I'll have to roll the tape again. I think you said you were wrong there for I a can, second. I, I'll have to roll am, that back. I'm confident in saying that. You know, <laughs> other people maybe can't admit they're wrong. But I, I'll admit that that's a place that I was rather skeptical. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to turn around, mm. you know. Um, uh, last headline. Last headline. The Pioneer Heart Failure Study has shown a push to start Entresto 
at the hospital as opposed to months later. Yeah, this is a medication I know you're uh, a big fan of. Um, it helps for reduction of re-hospitalization. It's a medication that um, it, sometimes people will already be on an ACE inhibitor, uh, which this contains um, something similar to an ACE inhibitor or ARB. Um, and it, it can be a little tricky to transition from that. They have to be off of it for so long, and then you start it. Whereas if they're in the hospital, they're in a monitored setting, it's very convenient to start it. And it shows that starting it in the hospital is better than starting it as outpatient, and it reduces hospitalization. Yeah, that, that's one of the biggest things. With heart failure is the rehospitalization rate is very high. And uh, that's added expense, that's added um, uh, morbidity and mortality because bad things can happen in the hospital so you know it's been shown for these heart failure patients we get it on early you know uh, earlier the better and sure. so we're starting to see that more and more and it was something we were usually waiting months to start this even though we identify this person should be on this and we'll, we'll start it in three months well they may have two rehospitalizations in that point and and, and then pick up a, an infection so uh, let's play a little game we'll play like name that ulcer you know I love and talk about the different ulcers here um, let's look at a couple of different ulcers here on the screen uh, what do you see when we see that first ulcer? Have you seen one of those? How yeah. would you describe that? I haven't seen it on myself, but uh, it looks as though it's ulcerated, to use a phrase, a definition for a definition, but uh, it's on the inner side of the leg, lower leg, and that is usually associated with a venous um, ulcer, and we see that very commonly in venous reflux, people with high blood pressure, sometimes with venous insufficiency, floppy valves in the venous uh, part of their system. Uh, compression dressing, sometimes we do a little antibiotics if it looks like it's gotten infected. And then additionally, seeing a surgeon can also help if we need to ablate those, uh, that venous structure. Yeah, these, these, these are a pain, literally and figuratively. These hurt, um, as opposed to some of the other ulcers we see. And, um, uh, and the problem is, is they can take, when, when one of these pop out, we're looking at months to get these to heal right. And the compression, I think, is one of the keys. And a lot of it's prevention. You know, if, if we have a lot of swelling in our legs and we have a chronic edema, and you start seeing that darkening of the legs, you know, that tells us that we have some venous stasis and we're gonna be setting up for one of these in the future. Now, here's some of the things that, you know, let's look at this next picture. This is kind of what they'll look like when they're starting to heal. Mm -hmm. um, is this at risk for another ulcer to form? Oh, certainly. Um, uh, well, how would you describe that? Yeah, so it, it looks as though um, it's an area of uh, healed injury, uh, still erythematous red. Uh, some patients might report it itches. Uh, some patients may report at times it gets bigger and then smaller. Uh, but it shows if there's the first time I'm seeing a patient and they have this, I would kind of question them regarding their chronic medical history and say you may be at risk for an infection here. Now we talked about venous, let's just switch it over to maybe arterial, you mm -hmm. know, arterial ulcers, that's a whole different kettle of fish, you know, and, and so briefly, what's that gonna look like? Are they gonna pop up quick? Are they gonna take time to show up? Mm -hmm. um, are they gonna hurt? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, certainly, uh, just anatomically, they're usually located on the outside of the leg, sometimes associated with symptoms of, wow, doc, my legs hurt when I'm walking, um, my calves hurt, when I rest it goes away. That's kind of a sign of arterial disease. They may have other comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, history of artery disease in their heart, uh, which kind of represents a systemic view. And then sometimes we see these little punctate all that kind of are just all around the leg and that's from the arterial supply as well. Now pressure ulcers because you hear about that sometimes in nursing homes or in the hospitals that someone developed a pressure ulcer. Are you going to see these in the same part of the body or how are they different? Sometimes if someone has a chronic movement disorder debilitated they're laying down they can develop them on their legs not very common and usually nursing does a great job in rotating them so that it prevents that usually a pressure ulcer we see on the back side very common decubitus ulcer and they can be uh, very extensive um, and limiting yeah once they start they there you, you you have a, a hill to climb to get out of those mm -hmm. uh, and there's also often a lot of malnourishment sure. issues and, and, and uh, things with that. And lastly, I think the diabetic ulcer or a neuropathic ulcer, how, how are those different? Generally, on the foot we see them, plantar ulcers. Um, sometimes they can be painless because uh, they have had their nerve fibers kind of uh, destroyed by all the hyperglycemia. Um, 
And uh, they can be difficult to treat as well. Usually vascular flow to the area is poor. A lot of times we have to take them to surgery and have them cleaned out and debrided. Yeah, they're high risk in the getting infected too. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems with them. And that's uh, when we start whittling away, it's, it's a problem. It's a big diabetic problem. That's why it's important to get your diabetic foot exam. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I'm getting the signal. We've got stuff to talk about, but the show is over. You know, we're going to have to save it for the next show. Yeah. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us for the, the final segment of It's Your Health. I hope you learned plenty of information. If any of that information you want to apply to yourself, make sure you review it again with your health care provider. Thank you for watching It's Your Health.